The first thing that you're gonna have to learn is the layout of the press. This press from bottom to top is blue, red, yellow, and then black. Those levels are split down the middle so that each side of the tower has its own couple. And all a couple is, is a plate cylinder and a blanket cylinder that applies the image to the paper. You're gonna have to understand some of the terminology that we use. The operator side is the near side of the press and the drive side is the far side of the press. It's referred to as the drive side because that's where the motors are that drive the cylinders. And the op side is called that because that is where the operators stand. The different spots on the cylinder are gonna be called op, op center, drive center, drive, or near, near center, far center, far. Most commonly we use op and drive. These also may be referred to as A, B, C, and D. This press is made up of eight towers. Each unit is assigned a number. On the left side of the press, it's two, three, four, and five. Then the folder in the middle. Then on the right side of the press, it's six, seven, eight, and nine. Now when you get a layout, it's gonna be a piece of paper that looks like this. And if you turn it to the right, that should be in alignment with the way that the press is actually laid out. On the far left side, you've got two, three, and then you'll notice that four is actually split. So we have four AB and four CD. Four AB is the lower two levels and four CD is the upper two levels. The reason it's split like that is because that has actually been turned into a mono unit. It's the only unit that we have like that. And mono just means that it has a single couple that's running and that is the black couple. So it's one tower that's been turned into two units. That way we can have more pages, but the pages you run on it cannot have color. And if you look at the layout sheet, you'll see that there are sections labeled, typically A, B, Sun, C, and D. And you're going to have to learn how to read that. So let's look at this example here. The A section is eight pages. Now every section is made out of a U shape. So you can read and count here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now the reason we didn't count the pages on tower seven that went there is because they have an angle bar. You can see the arrow that points toward the operator's side. That means that there is an angle bar where the paper is going to be moving towards the operator's side. So then the D section has 14 pages and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's very critical that you look for those angle bars, that you understand where they go, and that you put the pages in the correct position. The sun section and the C section both have eight pages, and the B section has six pages with an angle bar. When you get a layout like this, typically you wanna fold it up so that you can fit it in your pocket. Make sure that you're putting the pages on the correct tower. You have to make sure that you keep track of that because if you put the plates on the wrong tower, then that's what we call a transposition, and the press cannot run with a transposition. So first, start by separating the plates. The plates typically come out with two blacks, two yellows, two magentas, and two cyans. Magenta is the specific color of red that we use, and cyan is the specific color of blue that we use. We separate the plates out so that we can easily spot them on the units. And to do that, we take all the blacks and yellows that go on the upper level, and we put those in one position, and we take all the blues and reds that go on the lower level and put those in another position. We have a rack that we've been using for this. We always put the blacks and yellows in the front, the blues and breads on the back. We always separate the plates by their section. So the A plates go on the left side and the D plates go on the right side. Put them in the order that they're going to appear on the layout. So for example, this plate is page eight of the sun and it is black. You'll have two of those, then two yellows, two magentas, and two cyans. After you have the plates separated, it's time to spot them. So here I've got page eight of the sun that goes in the far center position on tower 13 on what we call the 10 side. And if you're on the operator side of the press looking at it, the left side is referred to as the 10 side and the right side of a unit is referred to as the 13 side. It's called that because every cylinder on a press has a number assigned to it. 10 is the number that is assigned to the plate cylinder on the left side and 13 is the number that's assigned to the plate cylinder on the right side. So I spotted eight sun and now I'm gonna grab Grab one sun because I know it goes right next to it and spot that. Next I got page seven sun and two sun goes right next to it. So next I'm gonna grab the D section, and the first page I have is D5. That goes on the far side of tower seven. The next page I have is D4, that goes on the near center on the 13th side of tower seven. D1 goes on the near center of tower six on the 10th side. D11 goes next to page four on the far center of tower seven. D10 goes on the op side of tower 8. 
D8 goes on the near center of the 13th side of Tower 8. D7 goes on the near center on the 10th side of Tower 8. D12 goes on the far center of Tower 7. D13 goes on the operator side on the 13th side of Tower 6. And D14 goes on the operator side of the 10th side of Tower 6. That's all the blue and red plates that I have to spot right now. But you are going to notice that there are these little lines or dashes or hashes all over the layout. And what those are representing are pages that have color. Any page that does not have that dash does not have color. Now you can't just leave it blank. You have to put what we call a dummy on it. But you have to get those plates on those positions. That way the press can still transfer water to the cylinders to keep them clean. If any of the towers have a three quarter or half roll where there's going to be that X, those also need to be dummied out. And you'll need four plates for every position. Something to consider is that when you're spotting these if you don't put them into the exact correct position or if you just put them kind of in the general area you might confuse them later on when you go to actually hang them put them in the wrong place and get a transposition so try to make the extra effort when you're spotting them to put space where it's supposed to be every once in a while you're going to get a plate that has only black it'll be called gray and if the layout says that it has color but it's black only then you have to make sure that the person that's running that unit knows that they killed that color six dog and nine dog have no color after you've spotted the bottom plates, then it's time to grab the yellow and black plates, go to the top, and start spotting those as well. Something to keep in mind is that you're responsible for these units, so if you're walking around and you see that there's a pile of ink somewhere, or if there's a hose unplugged, you need to make sure that you let your supervisor know, because if that's a sign of a problem where you could have caught it now instead of during the run, then that could have saved us a lot of downtime. So be aware of what's going on. After you've spotted all the plates, then it comes time to hang them. And this is something that you have to be very delicate about. The plates are made out of aluminum, and and the plate cylinders are made out of steel so you can easily bend the plates but you're not going to be able to destroy the plate cylinders if you look at the top and the bottom of the plate you're going to see a little hole cut out and those fit snugly onto a pin that pin is also called a dog when you have the plate aligned in the correct position it should slide in smoothly and easily and there will be a clip inside that's going to put tension on the plate to hold it in place there's definitely going to be some trial and error as you're starting but after you do it long enough eventually you'll just be able to feel when that plate lines up correctly but it is critical that it does line up because if it doesn't then the registration isn't going to line up and then you might have to shut the press down to rehang it so take extra time be extra careful that you're hanging these plates correctly it's also worth double checking every single plate that you hang before you hang it to make sure that it's in the correct position so keep the layout handy as you're hanging them look at the plate that you're hanging make sure that you're putting the magenta plate on the magenta cylinder and make sure that you're putting the cyan plate on the cyan cylinder every once in a while we will get a plate in a stack that isn't ordered correctly and you have to be aware of that when that happens when you're first starting out doing this process correctly is going to take a long time but that's okay it's better to do it right and the speed will come later as you're hanging the plates, the image is going to be upside down. The acute bend is going to be at the top and the obtuse bend is going to be at the bottom. When the plate slides in, there should be a very tiny gap at the top, then spin the cylinder around. For a new guy, putting the bottom of the plate in is usually fairly tricky. You have to grip the plate with your fingers to hold it in place, then grab the bottom of the plate with your thumbs, pull it up, and then push it into the clip. If you do it correctly, the plate should slide in, the clip should grab it, and the cutout should fit right over the dog. Now if you press hard enough, you can actually get it to smash onto the dog. Because the plate is made out of aluminum, it can bend, and if that happens, the plate will not register, so the press will have to shut down so that that plate can be rehung. So be very careful when you're doing this. One thing that you're going to see eventually is what we call a double truck. A double truck is just two plates that are made into one, so it's double the width of a regular plate. These plates are going to have two cutouts for the dogs, but only one of them is going to actually be used to register the plate. You will find on this press that the dogs are actually not accurate, and the machine that we use to cut the plates for the double truck is at its maximum, so we cannot move it any further, so we have to extend that cutout ourselves. What I do is I just grab a knife, and you always go to the inside of the large hole, and just cut off a couple millimeters. You have to do that on the top end. And bottom of every double truck. Double trucks are also usually a bit more challenging to hang. Now, the only thing that you really have to remember is that the dog that actually does the registering is on the left side of the plate as you're hanging it. So it is critical that the left side of the plate slides into the dog. These plates also typically have the most expensive advertising, so if you mess them up, you'll be really making a lot of people mad. It should slot in just like any other plate, with a gap at the top across the entire plate, and then when you spin it around, the bottom of the double trucks is a little bit more tricky. And the reason is because if you grab it with your thumbs too far out, the middle of the plate is going to bend out. And if it's bent like that, you'll never be able to get the plate to slide in correctly. And if you have your thumbs too close to the center of the plate when you're trying to push it in, the outside edges of the plate will bend out, also resulting in the same problem. 
The trick to hanging this is you have to have your thumbs just on the inside of the cutouts for the dogs. If you put your thumbs there, it should slide right in. Once all of your plates are hung, all you can do is wait for more plates to come out until the entire press is hung, and then it's time to go. As a unit operator, it is going to be your responsibility to assist in pulling the leads in. This is also what we call the setup. There's two things that you need to know before you start doing the setup. The first thing you need to know is what is already on the press. So what leads are in, what formal boards are they going to, what bars do you have, where all the webs already are. Now this is easy if you just ran the press because all you need to do is look at your layout. If you look at your layout, you'll see exactly where everything is. The next thing you need to know is what you have to put in. Looking at the layout again, if you look at the left side of the layout, you're going to see a few arrows. The arrows that point down mean that all those leads have to go to the lower former board. The arrows that point up mean that it has to go to the middle or a third high. And the third highs are typically labeled. It'll actually say third high. And the former board is just a triangle made out of metal. That is also what we might refer to as the first fold. And the former is called that because it is the piece that forms the section. So for the layout that we had, the lower boards were the A section and D section. The mid boards were the sun section and C section. And the third high, we only ran one and that was the B section. So let's say that there's a web in and we need to not have that web in. What you have to do for that is you have to do what we call a tie off. You take the web, you tear it, wrap it around a pipe and then tape it back onto itself and that's called a tie off. The most critical part of this is that you use plenty of tape so that it doesn't fall back and that you tape it straight. If you tape it at an angle, it will tear. And if it tears, it'll fall back and we'll need a whole new lead sent back up. If you need to stick a lead in, then it's the opposite of that. You just tear off the tape of a lead that's tied off and pull it. Make sure that it's going over the correct pipes and the pipes are usually labeled. So if you're pulling in tower two, you're gonna look for the pipes that are labeled tower two and it'll have an arrow over or under it. Pull it over or under those pipes until it's in the former board. Make sure as you're doing this that you're cleaning up all your trash after yourself because you don't want to have to run upstairs and then have to pile through a bunch of trash. All the trash, crumple it into a ball, throw it over the side into the trash can. Now you might notice that as the paper is going over the former boards that it is getting cut down the middle. There's two places that you can cut a web before it gets to the former board. One is at the RTF and that's called roller to former. That's why it's called that RTF and that is the driven roller that is just above the former board. On that roller is a slitter and you just flip the toggle to engage it. Make sure that you're being very aware of that slitter because it will absolutely chop your hand right off. That slitter can also be called the gain slitter. The other point that it can cut at is at what we call the drag slitter. That's on the drag roller and that is the other mechanically driven roller that every unit has. So that's the drag slitter and the gain slitter. But no matter what, one of those slitters has to be down all the time. And before you get started pulling webs in, you want to make sure that you at least have the gain slitter down to start cutting it. If you forget to put the gain slitter down and a web comes in without a slitter, it'll tear out both former boards. So make sure you have the gain slitter down. Once you have all the leads that you don't need tied off and you have all the leads that you do need stuck in, then you have to feed the balloons down. Each balloon has a specific set of pipes and just make sure that you follow the correct pipes all the way down. And at the very bottom, hand it off to the folder operator. As you're pulling leads in, you might find what we call a fold over, and that is just that the paper has folded. When you see that, it is critical that you pull that out. The way to do that is you go back to the source, so you have to follow the lead all the way back to where it was coming from, and then make a taper. If you do not pull out the fold over, chances are it's going to pull to one side and tear out the lead, so you want to get those out. The last thing you have to do is bars and splits. An angle bar is a bar that goes around what we call the turn sheet, then across an angle bar stack, and then follows the pipes into the former. All of the pipes that you need to follow are going to be labeled with a B, B for bar. You may have one sheet where half of the sheet goes to the second high former boards and the other half goes to the lower former boards. In that case, you need to use a split lead. And for that, you have to cut out that part of the sheet, run it around the turn sheet, and then to the correct former board. And those will also go on the bar pipes. And it is important that you hit the same pipes every time because if you do not, you'll be giving the folder operator a very difficult time. Now, if you're curious enough, the best way to learn is just to go up on your brakes and just see where all the webs are, see where they're going, and memorize their positions. This is the console. This is where you're going to be doing all of your work during the run. You'll see on the console there is a numpad. And it's just like the numpad on the keyboard. It works just like one. You can choose to use that or the numpad on the keyboard itself. It doesn't matter which one you choose. This is the button they use to choose the 
the page that you want to adjust. So you click that, then you type in the number of the section that you're going to be looking at. So A is the first section, B is the second section. We'll say we want to look at the first page, the very front page. Front page is in section one, let's say A section, so hit one, then a period, and then the page that you want. So one period one. If you wanted the first page on the second section, you would type in 2.1. And from there, we'll give you all of the information pertaining to that page. To the left of that, you'll see a series of buttons that are all going to allow you to adjust that page. And the default is the black is selected, so you'll be adjusting the black. But if you want to adjust the blue, you hit the blue button, red for magenta, and then yellow for yellow. To the left of that, you'll see the water, which is in blue, and the shade, which is in black. You can adjust that just by pressing the arrows up and down, and you should see a little LED that'll light up when you've hit it. One LED means that you've moved it up or down one point. The blue arrows on the left will adjust the water up or down on the left or right side of the page, and the blue arrow on the right will adjust all of the water on that page. So you can choose to do all of it or individually. The button above the page key is the home button, and if you click on that, it will take you back to the home screen. And then toward the bottom, you'll see the left and right curved arrows, and those will just go back or forward a page. So if you're on page one and you want to see page two, just click the right arrow and you'll go to page two. The screen that you're looking at is a touch screen, so you can just press on the screen and it will be as if you clicked it with a mouse. Or if you prefer, you can use the mouse. This is what the home screen looks like, and if you click on a tower, it will bring up the information pertaining to that tower. The button at the very bottom will show you all of the spray bars across the entire tower. This is the spray bar. All this is doing is it's putting water onto the rollers to apply to the plates to clean the plates up and this is the screen that sets it. So let's look at the top left. The top left is couple number seven. That is the black couple on the 10 side. Now, if you look just below that red bar, you'll see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but it's going backwards. Nozzle one is always on the operator side of the press. Nozzle eight is always on the drive side of the press. Below that are the green boxes, and if you look to the right of that, it says set. So whenever you put a number in there, that's the number you see on the page screen. So if you put a five in that green box, then you'll see a five on the page screen. That's where the user actually sets the number that he wants that to spray at. Now, not every nozzle is the same. There might be some corrosion inside it. Maybe the spring is wearing out because each nozzle might have its own problem. We also have a comp or a compensator, and those are the red boxes. You won't be able to change those, only the supervisor is going to be able to change it. So if you notice that a nozzle is running at a certain number all the time, you can tell the supervisor, he'll change the comp, and then you will have to worry about it less. Below that is the output. So the setting plus the comp is what it's actually running at. Now the thing that you have to take away from this is that if that output ever gets to negative 25, that nozzle will shut off. So for example, if you put in a negative 12 and the comp is at negative 13, you get a negative 25, you're getting absolutely no water. And that's a bad thing. You don't want that. And you can see right here that on tower 12, it is a three quarter to the drive. And the reason that I know that is because you can see nozzle one all the way across on both sides of the press are at negative 25. And negative 19 will spray a little bit of water, just enough to keep that area cool and to not allow ink to build up on the edge of the paper. And zero is the default for any page that has color on it. If you click on the tower number at the top left, left it will show you all of the shades and the speed that the modules are actually running at. So let's look again at couple number seven. That couple number seven is black and that it is currently not running. It is at zero speed. When it does run it will be running at 30% and there is no comp in it so it will take that speed of 30%. And below those modules are the ductors. The thing to know about the spray bars is that there is a duration when it pulses and it puts out water, how long that pulse is, and then there's another duration of how often it pulses. The numbers that you set are the duration of the pulse, and the number of the ductor is how often it pulses. The nozzles that you set affect only the individual nozzles. The ductor will affect the entire spray bar. So it's two different ways of applying more or less water. On the page screen, which is where you're going to be doing most of the adjusting, the water nozzles are going to be at the bottom and the ductor is going to be just to the left. Something you need to know though is that on the page screen when you put in a number we'll say five it's going to add five to the number that's already there. There's a negative one there I'm putting in five it'll actually go to four. It's adding the negative one and the five together. Whereas on the spray bar screen if you put in a number it's going to go directly to that number and that's true for everything except for the shade. The shade on the page screen if you put in a five it goes to five. If you put in a 35 it goes to 35. Eventually you'll just 
just know which one does what, but that can be very confusing for a new guy. There's two things that you're going to be controlling as you're running the units, and one of them is water and the other is ink. So we know how the water kind of works. Let's look at the ink. Now you have to understand how the ink gets into the system before you can understand why you do anything with it. So first, here's an ink pump, and it's a fairly simple thing. It's just a bunch of gears that pushes ink down out the bottom of it, and this pump is sitting in the bottom of a color flow module. There's an electronic motor called a Zeta motor that powers this module and makes everything inside of it spin. So it spins the pump and it also spins these brushes. And all the brushes are doing is it's constantly mixing the ink up and it's mixing up whatever water and ink is in there and it's keeping everything thin and flowing. At the top is a blade and that blade sits on some rollers that scrapes whatever ink is on those rollers off and back into the module. That way there is a clean consistent amount of ink going through the roller train all the time. Now you might notice that this module is about the width of two plates. And that's right, every module is responsible for putting ink on two different pages. So if you're looking at the layout on the A section, page 1 and page 8 are both being run on the exact same module. So if you turn up the black shade for page 1, you're also going to be getting more black on page eight so it is critical that you understand that all of the pages that you run are going to be ran in pairs now as the module spins it's going to be pushing ink out through holes in the front of it those holes are hooked up to tubes that inject ink into the rail and the rail is just a long block that sits on what we call the carpet roller and it's a carpet roller just because it has a threaded material on it that's job is to soak up all the ink so it soaks up all the ink it spreads it out evenly and then injects that onto the roller train once there's a nice consistent layer of ink on all of the rollers it transfers that onto the plate and then the water washes the excess ink off and then only the ink that you want is transferred onto the blanket and from there onto the paper to give you a nice copy. And what you're doing as a unit operator is you're creating the chemistry that delivers this ink at a very precise amount. Back on the tower screen if you click on the button to the right that looks like a vice grip that is the ink train clutch. Now as you're looking at a layout you might notice that there's going to be no color on one side of the unit. If that occurs then we can actually turn that clutch off so it doesn't wear out. In the ink train clutch you just go Go to the blue, red, and yellow levels and hit the out button and then OK. If you do that, you will also need to do that with the water and the color flow modules. The water is right next to it. It's called the dampening page pack selection and just hit off for those couples and then do the same thing for the color flows. Now, the color flows are a little bit more difficult to see because it's just a green border that's surrounding the color flow box. But if you click on it, you can hit OK and turn it off. And when you're looking at a layout and you're setting up your pages, you want to make sure that you only have the color flows on for the pages that require them. So if you only have blue, red and yellow on the operator side of a unit, you want to make sure that you only have those modules on and you have the other modules turned off. Off. It will save on wear and tear and it will also prevent you from putting an ink mixture into the non-running modules that you'll have to deal with the next time you have to run them. Now this screen is also telling you some other information. It's telling you how much ink is in the color flow modules and there's only two options. It's either level low or level high. Level high means that there's enough ink. Level low means that it's about to fill. Every once in a while one of the valves will get stuck or just open too slowly. When that happens that valve will turn red and to fix that you just reset it. So go up to the top right and hit reset alarms and hit OK. At the top left there's a button for the color flow blower and if you test the clean out valve all that's going to do is it's going to ram a bunch of air through the valve and if there's ink in it it will blast the ink out. To the right of that is a button for the ink valves themselves and if you click test on that it will push some ink out into the module. To the right of that is the color flow motors and you can test them to see if they're spinning correctly. To the right of that is the color flow ink rollers and if you hit test on that it will spin the roller and to the left of those are the blades and you can test those to push the blades on. And to the right of that is the ink rail. If you hit off, it will open up the rail so you can see if there's any problems underneath the rail. Above the water and shade is the registration. And the registration is in decimals, which is in decimals of millimeters. And if you move it, one click is 0.05 of a millimeter. So a very, very, very tiny amount. It's almost insignificant, but we are looking for perfection. When you're moving the registration, what you're doing is you're moving the color on the page up and down or left and right. A positive number will move it up or to the right and a negative number will move it left or down. 
To the right of the unit screen, you'll see a QTI button with registration marks on it. And that brings up the QTI screen. The QTI is a piece of hardware that will actually attempt to automatically register all of the colors together. That way you don't have to worry about up and down, left and right movement of the plates. And if you look up at the press someday, you might see these scanners that'll run left and right across the webs. And what that's doing is it's looking for these diamonds that are on the plates. And those are registration diamonds. It'll actually read those diamonds and then attempt to align the pages based on them. And in this screen, you set up what page it's going to actually try and read. When you go to it, when the job is first loaded, all these scanners are going to be disabled. So what you do is you go down to the bottom left and you hit restart. That'll restart scanner one, which is always on the 10 side of the unit. You'll see the triangle at the top will turn red and then the scanner enable box will then say enabled. Wait for the restart to go green again and then do the same thing for the 13 side. Then between the two restart buttons is a button called QTI settings. Click on that and then you can set the position. Position A is the near position. Position D is the far position or the dry position. Now this is something that you want to consider. The diamonds on the plate are always on the right side. That means that if you're looking at the 10 side of a unit and you put it on position A, that's going to be right on the web edge. So if the folder operator is having a hard time and he's pushing the web around, it could actually cut off the diamonds and you won't have any registration. So it's best to set those positions on the 10 side to D, C, or B. And only use A if it's the only position that has color. And the same goes for the 13 side. On the 13 side of a unit, because the pages always have the diamonds on the right, if you use position D, it could cut off the diamonds and you won't have any registration. So it's best to use A, B, or C. As a rule of thumb, you always want to set it to page one of a set section, so one able, or to the page with the biggest ads on it. So choose the position that you want and then hit OK. After that, go back, and there's actually a shortcut from here. You can just hit the center of the tower and it will go back. Then hit control mode selection and choose auto mode 1. Auto mode 1 means it's going to try and do everything by itself. Manual mode means it's not going to do anything. You put in the information yourself. Auto mode 2 means that whatever position that it was in, it's going to lock to that. And auto mode 3 means that you can move it and it will try to maintain the moves that you put in. So for example, if a plate was put on poorly, you can move it to try and correct it and then the QTI will try and maintain your correction. When you're first starting up, you always want to use Auto Mode 1. If you go back to the QTI Settings button, you can see at the bottom of the left it says Sets of Marks, which is 2, and 2 is always correct because we're using two plates for the same page. And at the bottom right, you'll see the Errors button. If you click on that, if there were any errors, it will show up here where the problems are. And it is also important to check this when you're done because that little yellow brick at the bottom should be in the top two positions. If it's not, then you did something something wrong and you just have to restart and do it all over again until it does it right. As long as it's not in those top two positions, the QTI will not work. And from this screen, you can also move the registration. Positive numbers go up and right and negative numbers go down and left. At the top right of the unit screen, you'll see what looks like a tractor trailer coupler. That'll bring up the engage tower screen. So as long as everything is correct on that screen that you've set up so far, if you click that button, it will synchronize the couples to the rest of the press. And then in the press will be ready to run. Most of the time, you're not going to touch this screen because if those are in, you won't be able to hang plates or anything else. But it is important to know where it is and what it does, and that way you don't touch it accidentally. After all the plates are on and the setup's in and everything's good to go, the folder operator will set all this up for you. From the unit screen, there's a button called Status. This is one that you're probably never going to use, but it's one you should be aware of. If you click on that, it will show you the status of all of the units. The most important ones that you want to note are at the very bottom, the temperature. So if it's starts getting really hot that means you've got a problem and you got to stop the press right away before it melts and at the very top where it says dr1 that's drive one drive two drive three if those are not green that means that those couples are disengaged and you can press the button all day long and it won't do anything in the event that there's ever a power outage those will all be kicked off and you'll have to turn them all back on back on the unit screen there's an error button anytime that there's any kind of a report made that there was a problem it's going to be in this screen you can go to that screen to see if there's anything you can use to diagnose it. And back on the unit screen, the test button will bring up a window that you can use to test the unit out. In the event that you wanted to troubleshoot a tower, this is where you would do it. You can walk a tower, you can stop it, and you can do all of that right from here from this screen. There's two buttons that look like a broken sheet of paper. One of them says F3, that's the folder, and the other one is going to say T for tower and then the tower number. And those are to turn the web detectors on or off, but that's not something you're ever going to do. That's for the folder operator only. At the bottom left, there's an oil button 
button. If the unit was running and there was no oil, that would give you an error. To the right of that is the button for the unit valve time delay. And to the right of that is the maintenance screen. If you ever walk in and you see this screen, do not touch it. Chances are maintenance is working on it, and if you do anything with it, you could make them lose their hands. So if you see this screen, do not touch it. Back in the maintenance screen, you'll see the running times and impressions. This is actually a counter for all of the hours that those couples have ran. And you can see the same thing for the scraper blades. And that's important to know because if it runs too long without those scraper blades being changed, it will wear down and you'll end up with a really bad ink laydown. And below that is the ink and damp rollers check, where you can test the stripe for the ink and damp rollers. Back on the unit screen at the bottom left is the side lay register and at the bottom right is the cylinder offsets and this is just to rotate the alignment to the cylinders around to a much higher degree than you could ever get with the registration buttons it sets the default registration once you've gone through all your towers and you're convinced that everything is set right it is a good idea to take a look at the layout and just go through all the pages and make sure that the layout is correct so 1.1 should be on tower 6 then hit next page and make sure that page 2 is on the correct tower page 3 is on the correct tower and go all the way through the layout to make sure that everything is correct because sometimes it's not. The only thing that's left after that is just to run it. The folder operator is going to throw all the units in, it's going to make it hot, and the press is going to start running. When that happens, you have to grab the paper, bring it to your console, and you have to look through it very quickly to make sure there isn't any immediate problems, and you have to start getting the ink and water balanced just right so that we can call good copy as soon as absolutely possible. The quicker that you can get a good gap, the better a unit operator you are. Now you'll notice if you grab a paper and you put it in the center of the console that the layout of the keys are split in the middle so the buttons that are on the left are going to control the left page and the buttons that are on the right are going to control the right page if you look at the number that's on the console it's going to show the section and then the page that you're on and as you get to the end of a section on the left side it might say 4.8 indicating that you're on the eighth page of the four section and then on the right side it'll say 5.1 indicating that you're on the first page of the fifth section now it's very important that you keep track of what you're doing because quite often especially for a new guy they'll put down a page and they'll start adjusting ink on it not knowing that they're actually adjusting an entirely different page so it is very important that you do double check yourself and make sure that you're adjusting the correct page shade is going to make the ink on the page darker or lighter but water is also going to do the same thing the less water you have the more ink you're going to have and if you don't have enough water then the ink will start making a mess over the whole page and give you what we call scum you don't want scum and you don't want tint to get rid of scum and to get rid of tint you add more water but if you add too much water then what's going to happen is you're going to drown it out and when that happens you're going to look at a page and there's just not going to be any ink on it whatsoever it's going to be washed out so your goal is to make that happy medium you want to put on the least amount of ink to get the darkest image you can so you want to keep the water as low as you can without scumming or tinting and then put on just enough ink to give you the correct image there's a term that press operators use that you need to learn and that is called emulsification emulsification is the addition of water into ink just before it breaks back down into water. So you keep on adding water to the ink, but not so much that it breaks back down into water and then floods out. When you first start out, you're probably not gonna know where to put the waters, and that's perfectly fine. That's gonna make total sense. Don't really worry about that. Just play around with it and try and figure it out. There's a typical rule of thumb. When you're setting the ink in water, you wanna do tiny movements. So just a couple points at a time. You do a couple points and then see what the result is. And if that wasn't enough, you do a couple more points. Only in very extreme situations will you do a move of we'll say 10. 10 is huge. So if there's something really going wrong, then you do a move of 10 points. But for the most part, do very small moves. One thing that a new guy will regularly screw up is that he'll grab a paper, make a move, grab another paper immediately, and then see if the problem is still there. They'll see that the problem is still there, make another move, and then do that over and over until the problem is gone. The issue is, is that what they're not taking into account is the amount of time it takes for when you hit a button for something to actually occur. Let's say that there was some scum. You saw some scum, so you put some water on it it's going to take a little while for that pulse to actually increase to put the water on the roller train for that roller train to mix it up spread it out thin it out and then get that onto the plate it has to put that impression on the web and the web has to go all the way through the press and the press is moving at 30 feet per second but some of these webs are over 100 feet long so that means it's going to take at least three seconds to get from the unit to the folder and then if you look at the folder it actually takes a few seconds to get from the folder to the unit operator so if you make an adjustment and then 
and grab a copy right away and expect there to be a change, there's no way that's going to happen. What will happen is you'll make a change, see if there's nothing there, make another change, and you'll actually put on twice as much as what you really needed. So you'll go from having scum to flooding out. There's a rule of thumb that I have, which is that you give it 10 seconds. So when you make a move, wait 10 seconds, at least 10 seconds, before you grab another copy to look at that. If you're making nothing but big moves all day long, you're going to be fighting yourself all day long too. You make little moves, and that way when it gets really close, you can make even tinier moves, and you'll have a high quality product very quickly. One of the last things that you have to know while you're running the press is that you have to persevere all the time. It's going to be tempting to kind of sit back and stretch and relax after everything looks good. You grabbed one copy, it looked good. You grabbed another copy, it looked good. You grabbed another copy, it looked good. So you're just going to take a little stretch for a minute, but you really can't do that. The reason is, at any given time, something could go wrong. There are so many moving parts. Each tower has eight couples, and every couple has eight water nozzles. All right, so that means that for every tower, there is 64 water nozzles. And if you're running eight towers, that's 512 water nozzles, and any one of those could die at any given time. It's rare for them to die, but it could happen. And if it does happen, and you're in the middle of stretching, and then a bunch of copies go out that have scum on it, you're going to have to kill all those. And fighting waste is really the biggest part of your job. You want to have good quality copies going out all the time. And we're talking about the integrity of the newspaper, and not just the consumers, not just the people that are buying it, but also for the reporters that put their heart and souls into writing these stories. There are some really important stories, and the integrity of the newspaper is that when you go on the internet and you see a story about a celebrity that died, but then you find out that the celebrity didn't actually die, that's integrity. And there's a lot of really big stories by newspaper workers that have put a long time and even blood, sweat, and tears into writing. And it is your job and your responsibility to make sure that those stories are clearly presented to the public. If one of our writers writes an amazing story and it's illegible, they're not going to print it for a second day. So if you fail, that story is gone. And so for however long it takes while that press is running, and even before that press is running, whatever you have to do to make sure that you have a high quality product, that's your job. That's your responsibility. Now if you do this enough times, eventually you're going to start noticing that a lot of these numbers that you're putting in the spray bars are the same. So nozzle number one, there was a negative seven yesterday. I was at negative seven the day before that, and it was at negative seven the day before that. You can probably figure that today it's also going to be a negative seven. And when you start noticing that there's these patterns, you can start putting them in before the run even starts. And that way, as soon as the run starts, you already be right where you need to be. Now, there's different factors that are going to change that. Like if you're going to be running a press that's hot, like it will actually be physically hot if it's been running all day, then that number might be different. If you're running a press that's cold, it's going to be different. The person that ran it before you might have flooded it out. You might be looking at running a module that has a ton of water in it, so there's going to be problems right away. But for the most part, you might start noticing that there is a pattern, and if that pattern exists, you can start being prepared for it. Chances are you're going to see that there's actually a ton of patterns like this. Now, when you're talking about 512 nozzles, it's not going to be easy for you to remember all those all the time. So what you can do is you can actually print those out. Now, if you print it out, you can only really see what ran on that day. So you'll have to print out that day, and then the day before that, and then the day before that, you'll have to keep on printing it out. And then you can compare the nozzles to see if it was a fluke or if it's something you think you should probably use. So those are two options. Option one, you just start remembering. Option two, you start printing it out. Or option three, which is what I use, where I actually write them down. And I put it in a format so that I can see the last few days that I ran it so that I can use that to make an educated judgment of what I can be looking at today. And as you get these compensations down, and as you see the nozzles and shades and ductors are typically ran in a specific spot, you can take that information, bring it up to your supervisor, and then the supervisor can change the compensators on it so that you don't have to do the work, and so that the people after you and before you also don't have to do the work. And then as you come into a press where you used to have problems with modules that had too much water, now you don't. So it's good for them, it's good for you, it's good for everybody. That little bit of extra work can make a ton of difference. Now when you're not setting up runs and you're not running runs, the only thing you've got left is downtime. And during downtime you do detail. Detail is just simple things like changing the blades in the modules or cleaning out the ink pans where ink drips down through the unit and then collects in these pans. You have to clean those out and general maintenance like that. But something that separates the good operators from the bad operators is that they're going to take that time to look at the units and really see problems as they're appearing. So when you're running a unit and you're saying, hmm, I'm just having a hard time getting red in this certain spot. When you're actually doing detail on that unit and you're looking at that spot, you can say, oh, there's a puddle of red ink here. Maybe that's my problem. So you want to keep your eye out for little things like that and start putting two and two together and then you can start fixing the problem so that when you're running the units, your job is easier. But also to identify problems before they become big problems because you can easily turn a $50 fix into a $20,000 fix by ignoring it. 
So do the detail, do it well, and keep your eyes open. Beyond that, as long as you can keep on showing up and showing that you're capable of learning, capable of understanding, capable of doing a little bit of math, and in general not fucking up, then eventually maybe you'll be able to move on to the last press operator position, which is the folder operator. And that's where things get really complicated.